Sandy Hammond is from the Boston area and she is a singer songwriter and choral director, a voice teacher and composer. She became interested in music initially after going to the Nutcracker at age five and sitting in the back seat of the car. Her parents were witness to her performing another uh, version of Nutcracker uh, with her as composer and saying now the flute plays and uh, orchestrating uh, and enacting uh, the musical program that she so loved. She went on to take piano lessons at age 11 and to write her own songs and participated in children's choirs and went on to her own performing and writing and then also to teaching and has been doing so for over 20 years. She has two CDs of her own and recently also released a CD in collaboration with her colleagues known as ESP Vocal Trio. When I asked Sandy why we share our songs, knowing the activist work she now is doing out in community, Sandy said, sharing songs is important. It is about sharing stories and expressing emotion. It is about connecting and healing. We are all one. And so, in her later work, she has written two musical comedies. She's launched a nonprofit organization known as Butterfly Music. Uh, she <coughs> notes that it now is in its beginning stage running on fumes and needing donors <laughs> and recently she has started a Kickstarter fundraising campaign. She has launched an all trans choir with Butterfly Music Organization which is only second in the nation and she also is facilitates and leads a choir for serious musicians who are young women who do provocative repertoire work on human rights topics. And that's called the Human Rights Choir. And right now they're working on choral work that Sandy composed and it's dedicated to the Nobel Peace Prize winner, Malala. And She's also hoping once she gets funding and staff to create a choral and vocal uh, opportunities and choir for survivors of sex trafficking. As she notes, she's met some amazing survivors. And when I asked Sandy for one of her most powerful moments of her work in using music with community in her butterfly music work and in activism, Sandy told me, when a transgender singer tells me that this choir helped them reclaim their singing voice after years of giving up, or when a transgender singer tells me, tonight's rehearsal is the only thing I left the house for this week. I would like to conclude the end of her introduction by saying again, as Sandy believes, music is about connecting and healing, and we are all one. And now I look forward to how Sandy will show that with her work and with her music and her activism. Please, a big hand for Sandy. Hand. So I picked this song for a few reasons. Um, who remembers Molly Bish? Who remembers that story? Yeah. So, um, Warren, Massachusetts is where she lived. That's, I think, about 40 minutes west um, of here. And when she was 16 years old, she was lifeguarding at a local pond. Her mom dropped her off. Uh, and she was never seen again. And um, for me, this is a feminist song because there is way too much violence in the world against girls in particular, also in the LGBT community. Um, and it's a song from a mother to a daughter. And um, I wrote it when I was haunted by that story. I remember driving down the turnpike and seeing signs everywhere. I read that it was the most well-funded search for a missing child in Massachusetts. Her parents were tireless. Um, and the day I wrote this article, The Globe had a cover 
of state troopers out in the woods in these orange slickers because two guys had gone hunting and seen, one of them mentioned, hey, I was up here last year and I saw this place called Whiskey Hill. I saw like remnants of a blue bathing suit. And the other guy said, well, that's what Molly Bish was wearing. And they reported it and eventually they found her remains. My hands are shaking, this is like... I'm usually on the piano. Dozens of men in shiny orange coats fan out through the woods, raise my hopes. They're like silent soldiers. It all seems so strange. It's like they're in church outside in the rain. When I start to imagine what he might have done to you, I stop and count to ten and I remember the few moments that we had that day talking in the car as we drove to the pond the sun shining hard I brought you I brought you I brought you into this world how I love you how I love you I love you Molly my girl Molly my girl to outlive your own child well that's some cruel curse I'd go in your place if I could bring you back to earth. I could watch you grow old then. I'd smile from above. I'd find a way to make sure you could still feel my love. But I go into your room now, see some pictures and a comb. I stare at these things hard as if that could bring you home up on whiskey hill they found a scrap of blue I can't imagine that's all that's left of you I brought you I brought you I brought you into this world how I love Molly, my girl, Molly, my girl. I remember the day you were born. Heather could not wait to hold her sister in her arms. Hours of labor to bring you here. But in eight sorry minutes, you disappeared. To outlive your own child, who would think of such a curse? I'd go in your place if it would bring you back to earth. I'd watch you grow old then. I'd smile from above. I'd find a way to make sure you could still feel my love. I brought you. I brought you. I brought you into this world. How I love you, how I love you, I love you, 
Molly, my girl, Molly, you're my girl, Molly, my girl, Molly, my girl. So those things shouldn't happen, right? <laughs> and I know there's violence against boys and men, but um, my father's a social worker who told me that about 85% of violent crimes are committed by men, but it's 10% of men committing those crimes. So um, uh, I know it's kind of a hard place to leave you. Um, and I was reading again last night about the um, investigation, and there have been three different uh, men that have been investigated and it's still not resolved. Um, so, yeah, I was pushing the singer-songwriter thing and getting bored. <laughs> um, and I have friends who are still doing it, um, who've gone on to be on Oprah or move to Nashville and make a lot of money and um, that's great and that wasn't for me. I didn't have that singular drive like you know, to expand my mailing list and have people buy my CDs and whatever. Um, so I was looking for something bigger and I've done, um, uh, I have two resumes and so um, uh, it's interesting when I circulate both of them, but one is a music resume and the other is a business resume. Um, and for nine years I was in the communication side of a public health policy program and um, I've been in corporate sales and marketing, and so for me, I'm finally able to marry uh, launching an organization, right? A nonprofit is a nonprofit incorporation, and um, and the music. And as a voice teacher and a, a, chor a lover of choral music and a director, um, I started to hear from my students um, different stories. One was I had a transgender man come to me for voice lessons about 10 years ago. And I knew he had transitioned, that he had been assigned a female birth, a female gender at birth, and later transitioned to become the man he is today. He didn't know I knew that. So he came to me and he said, I used to sing a lot. I thought, okay, maybe he means before. Uh, and I really want to get back into it, and I'm scared because it's been a long time, and can you help me? I want to audition for a choir. And I was really moved by that story, but also interested in what would happen in the vocal mechanism. So as a singer, your voice changes your whole life, right? So I'm, I'm 46 today. I don't sound the way I did when I wrote this song um, 12 years ago. Um, so what, what, is that, what is that story um, in that person's soul, their psyche, the... Um, uh, what, it, what is in that? And then in the body, right, it's all connected. Uh, I mean, imagine having a speaking voice that you hated or, um, I don't know, I was really drawn just the, the metaphor of voice, right? All of Carol Gilligan's feminist writing is using voice as metaphor for women's psychology. Um, so I was interested in, in that aspect of the human experience and, and what happens for an adult to go through that kind of transition. And then I started hearing stories from my friends in the transgender community. Um, a friend in Seattle was in a women's choir for years and didn't even know you could transition. And when this person found out, they were like, oh my God, I'm a guy. This is so awesome. I'm going to go. And um, he now sings in the Seattle men's chorus. Well, to switch, they made him get a letter from his doctor. And I was like, um, if you can sing, you get to be in a choir. So, I mean, if you want to sing. So I sort of have this, like, everyone has the right to sing point of view. Um, I believe in democratizing music. Um, and uh, so that was a compelling story for me. And then also in that time, when he joined the men's choir, after getting a letter from his doctor, um, his voice was still transitioning and he had been given a solo and then it kind of like went badly because of what was happening. And the director just was not nice about it and not understanding and didn't anticipate it and didn't know how to, you know, and I, I can't really blame the music community for not being prepared or, or I mean, it's, it's ignorance, right? So, 
but we have to do something about that. So how do we create knowledge, resources? Um, all of the data right now is kind of oral storytelling. Like, hey, I went on testosterone, this is what happened to my vocal cords. Um, it's anecdotal and qualitative. I, I want places like the Mass General Voice Center to like do this. <laughs> um, and as a singer, I went recently and got my own vocal cords scoped, which you do from time to time, maybe poets do too. And during the process, I was like, hey, so who do you have here that specializes in transgender vocal health? You know, nothing. Um, so for trans women, um, the changes, the challenges are different. Speaking, singing, um, going on estrogen does not um, uh, change your pitch, right? So you may walk into Dunkin' Donuts and look really feminine and feel really feminine and dress feminine and then you open your mouth to order coffee and people are like, oh my God, are you a dude? Like it's just, it's really, it can be really stressful. That's not the voice this person wants to inhabit and it's this runs really deep for me as a singer I cannot imagine having to go through a major I would find it terrifying to go through a drastic or difficult vocal transition um, so I also heard a story of a trans woman who joined a women's choir and this person's voice is still a baritone there was nowhere to put that person musically without re rewriting the entire piece so I saw a need for a trans-only vocal space. And for a lot of reasons, safety, uh, emotional safety, musical safety, and a space to figure it out. So, you know, we have singers who um, might sit in one section one week and the other the next, and there's no judgment and no, you know, the, the people have to be free to be who they are. They get to figure it out. Um, now, musically, there are choral directors who would not want to do this because the, if you take soprano, alto, tenor, bass, you know, that's the traditional choral model, it's totally binary. Women are either sopranos or altos. Men are either tenors or basses. Um, every now and then, I see a postmenopausal woman who's like, hey, I'm singing tenors, and, you know, it's, it's like this kind of stereotype of the postmenopausal woman. Um, so, um, uh, that's the only place there's really any wiggle room, right? I mean, so it's, the binary thing just has to, to over the side. So the range we're working with is baritone without low bass, baritone tenor, tenor, a little bit of alto, it's pretty much it. Sometimes you have trans men who, for whatever reason, choice, maybe they're delaying the decision, aren't on testosterone and could sing, in a high treble range. But that is not desirable for them. That is not pleasant. Um, likewise, a trans woman might have a bass voice that they've lived with for a long time but not want to use it, and they're trying to develop their falsetto. So in some ways, the range is narrower. I see it as rich with opportunity. Timbre is different. Um, as a composer, there are unique opportunities to um, create. And we don't really know what we're going to find. Right? Like we could find something really, really beautiful and new and different. So when I started this, um, and a member of the chorus is here with me, is going to come up and sing, so I really need to stop talking soon. Um, I got an explosive response on something called the Facebook Transgender Alliance. Um, and I was shocked in my research to find one all trans chorus in the country, and I've been trying to get in touch with them. They are a gospel choir in Oakland, California. And you know, the LGBT community doesn't always have the happiest relationship with Christianity, but these were people who are like, I'm trans and I want to sing gospel, damn it. <laughs> um, so they do, and they do it beautifully. It's, I think they've had a Grammy nomination. Like, they're amazing. Um, but that's very different from what we're doing. They're more performance driven, as far as I can tell. We haven't even scheduled our first public performance. Like, do we allow photography? What if someone's out at home but not at work? What if someone has successfully transitioned and been hired as a man and doesn't want anyone to know, hey, it hasn't always been this way? Um, we don't put up signs in the hall that say transgender chorus in the parlor, right? Because, like, maybe you're not out. Um, it has to be safe. 
So um, I can't believe there isn't more work like this being done. And we joined something called Gala Choruses, which was started back in the 80s, Gay and Lesbian Alliance of Choruses. Um, that's why it's not like LGBTQA. It's a, like it's Gala is kind of a dated term. But um, uh, we are their only all trans member. You know, and it's a national advocacy networking because the choir is, of course, about a lot more than like, hey, we gave a concert. It's like, this is a trans group. This group is making a statement. This group is visible, right? There's this whole theme of visibility, invisibility, having to be stealth, having to hide who you really are. It's like, it's, it's about empowerment. It's about changing our culture. Um, so I think I'll stop. There, I'll just mention, I have no idea how much time we have left. Six minutes. Six minutes. Okay, great. I'm going to get Owen up here. Um, I also manage a women's human rights choir that's new. Totally different animal. It's by audition only. And um, we do provocative human rights repertoire. And everyone in it is pretty much a trained musician. And it's really exciting to see the women. It's, so it's participatory. It's not a hierarchical, I am your director and I will tell you what we're doing. Um, one woman is is Indian American. Her parents grew up in India. She just transcribed a Hindi lullaby for the group, and teamed up with another woman in the group who's a composer, and they're bringing that forward as a way to inform um, some of our next projects about women's rights all over the world. I mean, you look at Molly Bish and Warren Mass. You read about women in India <laughs> raped, murdered, uh, infanticide of young girls. It's not just China. It's India too. So. Um, you know, we're all we're all one family, right? Molly is Malala, is you, is me. Um, so that's why I do this work. Okay, so Owen is a member of the chorus and a songwriter himself and a lovely human being. So I'm gonna turn this over to him. We have flyers and stuff that I'm going to put on the back table. Hello, uh, my name is Owen, and I am a member of the Transgender Choir uh, with Sandy, and it's been a really amazing way for me to get back into music and get back into writing and singing, which, um, as Sandy mentioned, I was one of those folks. Oh, sorry, I was one of those folks who took a break from music and from singing for a long time um, when I started transitioning, so it was hard to figure it out, and there wasn't anyone to um, figure it out with me and now there's a whole room full of people to do that and it's really wonderful so um, I'm writing music again and I wrote this song the other day and I'm gonna play it <laughs> My time is almost up and I haven't said a thing I never follow up, this always happens to me Our time is almost up and I haven't said a thing I never open up, this always happens to me It still seems young and I might be going strong But I never follow through or I always take too long Even at 50% they're coming back asking for more I wonder what would happen if I let them see All of what's in store All of what's in store All of what's in store once I can give more. And she 
explains that the body and the brain don't always remember things the same way. And finally, I've got a reason for my shakes, for my shakes, for my shakes, for my shake, shake. As I pull into town, tears fill my eyes. The fierce defiance and grief roll over me as I feel the collective of souls gathering for the marathon. My sister, among the runners who swore last year that they would rise up against fear and run this year. She is running this year. Number 2813. I'll search the hordes from the sidelines, not a part of the runners, yet not apart. We gather in solidarity to love, courage, spirit. We are Boston Strong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.